Now farces can be written as vectors and there's two ways we can do this. The first way is using ij notation and the second way is as a column vector. So for example here, if I've got a farce say f1, then I could write this as say, for example, i plus 2j newtons. Okay, so that would be an example of a farce there as a vector. And the other way I can do that then is using um, column vectors. So for example, f2, I could write that just using the same one here. So let me just redo that bracket. So we can do that as one, two newtons. Okay, like that. Again, this just represents the exact same farce here, um, but it's just a different way we can present that. Now there's two things that you need to be aware of here. So we can find the resultant of farces as vectors. And the way we do that is just by adding the vectors together. So if I present two more vectors here, I'm oh, sorry, two more farces here as vectors, say f3 and f4. Okay. So let's say f3 here is um, 2i minus j newtons, and f4 here is minus 4i plus 5j newtons. Then the resultant here of f3 and f4, if I say that's r, so that's typically what we use there to represent the resultant, and that would be f3 plus f4. Okay, so in that case, then I would just add the i components together, so 2i plus minus 4i. It's the same as doing minus 4i plus 2i. So in that case, I would get minus 2i there. And then for the j components, again, just add those together separately. It's the same as doing 5j minus j. In that case, I'm going to get plus 4j. And the resultant here is also a force, so we need to present that as newtons as well. Okay. And then finally, when a particle or an object's in equilibrium, then the resultant force is equal to zero. So that's just something to remember there. Okay, so if it's in equilibrium, then this implies or this shows that the resultant force is equal to zero. Okay. So this is a very important result. Um, or idea that you need to be familiar with, it will come up a lot across a lot of different questions that you study um, on your time for A-level maths, particularly doing this, obviously, the mechanics part here. Okay, so that's our introduction. Let's take a look now at a couple of practice questions here. Taking a look at the first question here, then we've got two forces. I've got 4i plus j newtons and minus i plus 3j newtons. And we're told that they act on an object. So for part A here, we're asked to find the resultant force in the form pi plus qj. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to call my resultant force R. So R here, so we're looking for R. And remember, all we need to do here to find the resultant force is add these two forces together. And in that case, I'm going to add the I component separately and then do the same with the J component. So for the I component, then I'm going to have 4I plus minus I, which obviously is just the same as 4I minus I. So in that case, then we're going to get 3I. And then for the J component, this is 1J plus 3j, so in total there we've got 4j. Okay, remember the resultant force is obviously a force, so I need newtons there. Okay, and there we have it, so that's in the correct form there, pi plus qj, same thing here. Okay, so that's part A. For part B then, we're asked to find the magnitude of the resultant force. So remember, we know how to calculate the magnitude of a vector. In that case then, I just need to apply Pythagoras to this. So the magnitude of the resultant, it's going to be the magnitude of r here, it's going to be the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. Okay, so 3 squared plus 4 squared. Remember, if you're not too confident with finding the magnitude of a vector, do check out our previous video from the pure part of the course when we had a look at finding the magnitude of a vector. So in this case then, just applying basic Pythagoras here, I'm going to get 9 for 3 squared, 16 for 4 squared, so the magnitude of r is equal to the square root of 9 plus 16, giving me the square root of 25. So the magnitude of r here. So I get the square root of 25, which would be equal to 5. Now the magnitude of the resultant force here is also a force, so I'm going to get 5 newtons there. Okay, so there we have it. So that's our solution to part A, and that's our solution to part B. So that gives us a solution to question 1. Taking a look at the very last question here to finish with, we've got a particle that's in equilibrium under the action of three forces, so F1, F2, and F3. 
and we can see those forces here. Now for part A, we're asked to find the values of P and Q. So where do we begin with this question here? Well, we refer to this part at the beginning, where we're told the particle is in equilibrium. Because that's important, what that tells us then is the resultant of these three forces, so F1 plus F2 plus F3 is equal to zero. Okay, so in that case then, if I add F1, F2 and F3 together, set that equal to zero, then I can easily solve um, to find the values of P and Q. We just need to do that for part A here, so F1 plus F2 plus F3 then. So in that case then, I'm gonna get PI plus QJ, that's F1. I'm gonna add um, F2 here, which is minus two I, so minus two I plus J. And then add F3, which is three I minus four J, okay? And when we're adding like this here, remember we just um, separate the I components, add those separately. So I'm gonna do P minus two plus three, and we know that that must be equal to zero because the particle is in equilibrium. So P minus two plus three is equal to zero. And all I need to do now is just solve this linear equation here for P. So three minus two is one. I get that P plus one is equal to zero. So in that case then P must be equal to minus one. Okay, so that's the value of P. All we need to do now is just repeat this here for the J component to find the value of Q. I'm going to get Q plus 1 minus 4 is equal to 0. So 1 minus 4 is minus 3. So I get Q minus 3 is equal to 0. And again, just solve for Q here. We get that Q is equal to positive 3. Okay. And that's our solution to part A, giving us the values of P and Q. So I'm just going to clear the screen here to have a go at part B. So we're told that the resultant of the forces F2 and F3 is R. Okay, so R is equal to F2 plus F3. Now we're asked to find the magnitude of R. So to start off with, let's just find the resultant of the forces. So R is equal here to F2, which is minus 2i plus j, minus 2i plus j. And then we add F3 here, which is 3i minus 4j. So 3i minus 4j, okay? Now remember here for the resultant, we just add the i components separately, then do the same for the j components. So what I'm gonna get here is minus 2i plus 3i, which is just the same as doing 3 minus 2, so I get i there, 1i, and I've got j plus minus 4j, so that's the same as doing um, 1 minus 4, giving me minus 3j there, okay? Now this is the resultant force, so that needs newtons there. But we're not done here, we want the magnitude of R, so I now need to find the magnitude of R by applying Pythagoras. So in this case, it would, this would be the square root of 1 squared, so 1 squared plus minus 3 squared. Okay, put this into your calculator if you need to, um, but if not, this should be pretty straightforward. So I'm going to get 1 here, so that's the square root of 1 plus 9, giving us the square root of 10. Remember, this also needs newtons here as well. So the square root of 10 newtons there. Okay, so that's the magnitude of R, and that's our solution to part B. And then for part C here, we're asked to find the bearing of R. So let's do C here at the very top. Now, to begin with here, for a question like this where you're asked to find the bearing of, say, a resultant force like this, I would always recommend drawing a diagram. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just so you can illustrate the problem at hand. So our vertical component here is the J component. So that's J. The horizontal component here is I, okay? So what I wanna do here is sketch the problem. So we've got our resultant force here, which is I minus three J Newtons. And that's what we're looking to find the bearing of. We're looking to find the bearing of R. If I sketch that then, that would be I minus three J. So it's gonna be somewhere down here as an example. Okay, like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect, but just so we can illustrate this, and that would look something like that. Okay, so that's the resultant force R there. If I sketch the other components on here, and I do that in a different pen color, we've got I there at the top, and if we go down three units, we've got um, 3J there, okay? And what I've actually got here is a right angle triangle. 
And why that's important then is because we can apply trigonometry here. Because what I'm actually looking for is the bearing of R. So if I just do this in a different pen color, what we're going to do here is start our north line, which would be this J component here. And we're going to go round until we touch the resultant force here. And we're looking for that angle that's formed. Okay. Well, clearly from J to I, that would be a right angle. That would be 90 degrees. So in that case, then I just need to figure out this angle here. Okay. If I call that phi here. Because in that case, then the bearing of R. So the bearing of R here is just going to be 90 degrees plus phi here. Okay. So what I need to do now is find the value of phi here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clear a little bit of this at the bottom here, just so we've got enough room to finish this off. So we should have enough room here, I think, to carry on with this. So finding phi here, we need to apply basic trigonometry. What I've got then is a right angle triangle. It's going to look something like this. So I've got my right angle here. This is one unit. This is three units. And this is the angle we're looking to find here, phi. So this would be tangent here. We've got the opposite of three. We've got the adjacent of one. So in that case, then tan phi is going to be equal to three over one, which in that case would just be three. Okay, so tan phi is equal to three. So if I want phi, I need to take tan inverse of both sides now. So phi is equal to tan inverse of three. Now remember, make sure your calculator here is in degrees. So phi is equal to tan inverse of three. If you put that into your calculator and it's in degrees, what you should get here is 71.6. Now that's to one decimal place. Okay, so that's to one decimal place. So that's this angle here. So for the bearing, then it's going to be all the way around, including this 90 degrees here. So finally, for the bearing of R, so for the bearing of R, that's going to be equal to 90 plus 71.6, which would give me 161.6 degrees there okay and there we have it so that's our solution to see like you can see drawing that diagram just helps kind of illustrate the problem in my opinion it does make it a lot easier so i would definitely recommend doing that but you don't have to you can get away without doing that um, but i just think for the time it takes you might as well do it okay and there we have it so that's our solution to the second question and that brings the end of this video on vectors as forces in the next video we're going to take a look at forces and acceleration